Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Today is episode number 89. I'm Phil, joined by Logan and John. And on today's show, we're going to discuss oil and water. Do they really mix or not? Stupid woodworker mistakes. And when you're right, you're wrong. Hope you enjoy today's show. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. Oh, man. So I had like big dreams of making like a little audio clip like that was like Logan's stupid woodworker mistake of the week, like in a, like a monster truck (laughs) announcer voice. Sure. Sure. I didn't do that. So no. So it's been a long time since I've admitted one of my stupid mistakes. And I did one this weekend and it kind of ties into when you, you know, you're right, you know, you're fine, but you end up not being fine. Right. Right. I was, uh, so this last season of the woodsman shop, we built a, uh, picnic table and I bought the, uh, the material for the top. Um, cause I kind of wanted to take the picnic table home when we were done with it. And we had built one bench on the show. Uh, I think Phil, did you make the bench or did Chris, Chris, might have. Chris did. I think Chris did. So he made both bench bottoms, but he didn't make the top for the second one. Yeah. So I had the material sitting in the shop and this weekend. I was like, all right, I'm going to finally put this stupid thing together so I can have two benches on our picnic table. And in the original plan, it was all like mitered and splined and ain't nobody got time for that. So we mm-hmm. doweled it mm-hmm. just like a, a faux breadboard end kind of and dowels. So that's what I did for this second one. And it was one of those things that I'm going to drill dowel holes I'm going to mark my depth with some blue painters tape. And I know that I drilled those holes deep enough. I held a dowel up to the bit. It was over halfway through. No issues, right? Mm-hmm. There were no issues with it until I got glue on and I started pounding that SOB together. <laughs> and I realized I had both ends glued on dowels, glue everything. There's what? Six dowels in it, three, three center slats, and then the ends. Um, two dowels in each slat on each end. Uh, and it got about an eighth of an inch away from being closed and it would not move. And I had the longest clamps we had in, in the shop clamping that thing. And those boards were bowed like a freaking Pringle chip. And I ended up beating it apart. And I mean, it was one of those things. It's like, I, I checked the depth. How right. is this not working? And then I realized I'm using a Brad point bit that, the way the spur spur and center work it's actually about an eighth inch maybe a little more than eighth inch shallower than what it is and it just it was one of those moments like i'm an idiot like i'm a professional (laughs) woodworker i do this for a living i can't get dowel joinery to go together yeah yeah i don't know how many times i have like i'm gonna cut this perfectly to fit like on some sort of construction thing it's mm-hmm. like just un- overcut it by a quarter of an inch and 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 let it be, you know. Yeah. Don't yeah. try to try to get the perfect depth. To just go deeper, and it's just it is what it is. Yeah. Get well, it it's together. like you know, there's uh, this kind of goes in with what my editor letter last issue of Popwood was. Is there? I mean, there's times where measurements don't really matter. And we've talked about this a little bit, right? Like there's times yeah. where just measurements are kind of arbitrary. Like obviously a drawer, the size of a drawer is dictated by the opening. Yeah. So, you know, the, there was a lot of people follow the mantra of, you know, old timey woodworkers didn't have tape measures cause it didn't really matter. And in some regards, that's true. I mean, everything was cut to fit. Yeah. Either fits or it doesn't. But like when I was gluing up this bench, so the, the bench and tabletop are made out of uh, a African hardwood called Iroko. 
And it wasn't super expensive. It was like $5 a board foot, which is pretty cheap in my opinion for a, a really dense hardwood. Um, and, but I didn't order a ton of extra. I ordered a little extra. And the problem that I think we run into when we order uh, hardwood um, a lot of times is some of it won't be usable, like whether there's tension in it or cracks or whatever. So what I'm getting at is I was at right at the cusp of not having enough material. And actually I shortened everything a little bit. Like yeah. the, the bench that Chris made on the show ended up being about 15 inches wide. This one or 15 inches deep. Sorry. Uh, this one ended up being like 14 and a half. And I'm like, this is going to look stupid. And I was like, no, it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah. really, it's just a place to put your butt. Right. <laughs> I mean, yep. And only really temporarily. Cause it's not often that you're going to be sitting at the picnic table for hours on end. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's one of those things. I'm like, you know what? I was kind of like, ah, what should I do? Should I rip? rip strips off of some of the shorter stuff and scab it onto the edges of these boards to make up the width. I'm like, man, it's not worth it. It's that's dumb. Don't do that. That would look weird. It, yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm like, this is no, not even going to worry about it. Got better stuff to do. Yeah. So, and even if one bench is 15 and the other bench is 14 and a half, you're never going to see that. No, no. And if somebody, Somebody says, hey, why is this one narrower than the other? Mind your own business. Get off, get out of my house. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and it, again, I mean, and I know we've talked about this on the show before, too. It's like there another time on the TV show that that's happened was that arch stretcher table we did. Oh, Somehow, yeah. I think the tenons for the arches got cut bigger than the plan set. And it's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter at all. It yeah. looks great still. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. so. I think that's probably most of the projects we build on the show. <laughs> are wrong and like, doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not that they're wrong. They're just maybe slightly modified. Because even the we were building those uh, the bookcases this season um, for that home office yeah. you know, thing. And I got the wood in. And they were all like solid wood sides and tops. And it's like to get the everything out of it that I needed, I needed to make them, I think, three eighths of an inch shorter or a little bit narrower just to oh, yeah. of, to work with the wood that we had. Kind of like what you're saying with the bench where it's like nobody's going to know. It's, it's fine. It's all yeah. arbitrary. You know, just make it work. So Yeah. And it is because I feel like a lot of people – I mean, we, in the Woodsmith drawings, we have a lot of dimensions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fewer than we used to, but there are a ton of numbers in there. And it's a false goal to try and hit those exactly. Yeah. You know, because I remember answering customer service questions where somebody thought that we had errors. And we will. We'll have an error from time to time. I mean, when yeah. you have that number of dimensions... And the number of humans that are involved here, there's going to be a mistake that crops up as much as we try and check them. Uh, you know, where somebody says, I cut all the parts to within four thousandths of an inch and these three things don't go together. It's like, yep. What do you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, like what Logan said, you're get to a point where you're just building to fit anyways, because you'll make, or your tape measure might be a little off or yeah, as you're going along or like working with plywood, it's not exactly three quarters of an inch. So that changes the interior dimensions of a, a case where you might have to fit the yeah. drawer to that size rather than what the parts say. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of so, like just the lines on the road. It's just a general <laughs> suggestion, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So that, I guess that's a question for you guys. Have you guys ever checked your tape measures to see if they're accurate? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, I only ask because I've seen, I've seen photos floating around on Facebook that people are like, oh, this is why you better check your tape measures. Yeah. And they're showing the ends of two tape measures. 
and the increments are like like scaled on one of them. So it's yeah. like you know the one inch is just a little off, but by the time you get to nine or ten inches, it's like a half inch off. Right. Right. Yeah, Which, I've looked at that just as a general curiosity because I've seen those photos on yeah. social media also. But it's like you know, it doesn't really matter if you keep using the same tape measure or just yeah. cutting to fit or as you go, it doesn't matter that much. But yeah, I'm sure you can run into problems if you're switching back and forth or whatnot. Yeah. So. Yeah. I will say that there's a few areas where that are related that I've found where I try, I mean, not really that I'm going for a specific dimension, but it's more about the fit mm -hmm. is that, uh, like the plywood back of a case. Yeah. It was one of those things where early on where it's like, you know, it's just the back of the case. And the last thing I want to have is that it's too big or whatever. So I always, you know, had a rounding error in there and made it smaller. So then it just, it fit into whether it was into rabbits or grooves or whatever. And sure. so long as it fit in there, then it was fine. And I do the same thing for like drawer bottoms and panels in like a frame and panel door or something like that. Thinking that you just, all it has to do is fit in the grooves and you're good to go. And that almost can, to me, f causes more problems because now you can have this panel kind of get a little cattywampus in there yeah. and it, you know, doesn't really kind of rattles around or doesn't really offer unless you really slop glue in there is not really making anything more rigid. So one of those lessons that I've learned is to take the time to make the cabinet back, for example, fit as close as it can. I mean, sure. you don't want it too big where it's pressing the sides or top and bottom yep. out or something like that. But if you fit it snug, then it actually makes assembly easier because you get to a point and you put the panel in and you kind of loosen up the clamps and then fit the panel. And all of a sudden, wow, you have a squared up case. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I will say I'm guilty about the drawer bottom thing because it's always, I mean, and it, it's kind of tongue in cheek now that I've said, you know, drawers are just cut to fit to the opening. But when the numbers are really weird, it's like, oh, I'm just going to cut that bottom just a smidgen smaller because... Same thing with the dowels. You cut it and you know it's going to fit until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've I've gotten in many scenarios where I'm trying to put a drawer together and I got glue all over everything. And all of a sudden the drawer won't go together because the bottom is just a hair too big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really annoying. Yeah, that's why I dry fit everything. You said your hate mail to John Doyle at yeah. aimmedia.com. <laughs> no, I don't do that. I do the same thing where it's like, okay, I cut all these parts and I know they're going to fit, start putting glue on. And now I go look for clamps while the glue's setting up and yeah. it's yeah. five o'clock on a Friday and everything's going wrong. And yeah. So. Yeah. You know, that's, I've over the years started to slow down a little bit and call it, I don't know, call it what you will, bullheadedness of youth or something. I don't know. It's, I've started to realize that, you know what, if I slow down and I, I actually measure it carefully, it's going to work out better in the long run, you know? And so, may actually end up taking less time overall. Oh, you do. Yeah. You do. Absolutely. It's, it's like the, you know, slow is fast and fast is slow. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah. Now it was just one of those things. I was in the shop this week and I'm like, what an idiot I am. I I checked. <laughs> I knew that these holes were deep enough. I didn't dry assemble them. That would have fixed it. I know they're deep enough. Slap the glue, put the clamps on, and then grab a couple flathead screwdrivers and tear the entire joint apart as those dowels are swelling and locking everything together. Mm -hmm, and, so, mm -hmm. and then grab a pole saw to zip an eighth inch off of each <laughs> dowel. <laughs> Uh, 
What an idiot. You guys ever done anything just completely stupid? You're like, seriously, I know better. Oh, oh yeah. All, all the stuff. Yeah. All very similar things to that, whether it's drawers that were too large or. Yeah. yeah. I did a. What was I doing? Oh, I made a drawer case for the workbench that I made for my father in law. Sure. But here's the deal I made the drawer, the workbench which is at my father-in-law's place, 400 miles away from my shop, and then made the drawer case here mm, that's based cool off of measurements that I had taken from the workbench. So I made my own measurements, so it's not okay. like I was asking somebody else to read a tape. And as I was putting stuff together, I got to a part where I thought, this feels really, really wrong. Like just something wasn't right that I didn't understand it. And I had gotten the case for the drawers assembled and it was going to be too deep, like by yeah. an inch and a half. And I'm like, ah, crap. Because now I got to cut the case part down and now I got to cut all these drawer pieces down. And yeah. So I figured out a way to cut the cases with a circular saw and a straight edge and whatever. And it turns out that I had misread the number or misinterpolated the number for the depth of the workbench. And I actually had plenty of space to do it. So it's just a self-inflicted yeah. wound. Mm -hmm. I know. Those are the worst ones. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked about that uh, that case that you know finished up earlier this spring too, where I just assumed the depth of the cabinet to be something and built the the drawers just randomly a quarter inch deeper than what they were supposed to be, and ended up having to cut the back out of the cabinet to make the drawers work, and mm -hmm. it just worked out. But so another one that I that comes to mind is the the treehouse loft that I was building for. Uh, my little girls for Christmas several years ago. And so I was, it was a surprise. I'm trying to build it all in the shop and parts that I can bring home and put together um, when they were out of the house as a surprise. And uh, I, I don't know how many times I went to the house and measured walls and where outlets were. And so it all just get there and, and be ready to assemble and not have any problems. And I got home and started to put it together, and that's when I realized that I made a poor assumption that our ceilings were eight foot tall. They were like seven foot eight or something, and so it was taken all back apart and bring it back to the shop, and I had to cut stuff down, and so it all worked out. But it's like as trying to be as careful as I could, and I just made one poor assumption, and yeah, all hell broke loose. So yeah. yeah. Hmm. So this last week, uh, so the pop wood crew is pretty small, right? There's mm -hmm. me and two other people and that's it. That's the crew. Yeah. We definitely beat you guys in a like tug of war. Right. Yeah. Like, challenge or, yeah. or whatever. Red Rover. Do they play yeah. Red Rover anymore in school? I don't think that they do because it's so dangerous. Yeah. I don't know of a time that we've ever, game. yeah, ever played that where somebody didn't cry <laughs> or break an arm or get whiplash or. Or something, but oh, ah, the good old days. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they were. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Bring back Red Rover. Uh, anyway, darts with the metal tips. Yeah, uh, I'm getting to that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, last week I had uh, the two other Popwood crew members, Colin and Danielle, down here uh, in Des Moines for the week, and. We were working on a handful of projects, um, not myself, but they were. Um, Colin was working on a pair of mid-century nightstands for an upcoming issue. And Danielle was working on a project for a further out issue. Um, and that project that she was working on, just because you brought it up, Phil, is um, we're going to do three different sets of lawn games. It's going to be kind of our spring issue. Um, so there's going to be some outdoor projects, spring uh, lawn games, stuff like that. Kind of priming you for summer. And the three of us have very different 
uh, skills in woodworking or, or, or levels of experience. Um, you know, Daniel uh, is the newest woodworker. Colin's kind of the intermediate, and I've been woodworking much longer than either of those. Uh, so we're kind of taking three different approaches. So Daniel is doing a what's called a cup cube 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 set. I've never played it, so mm -hmm. um, pretty simple. Uh, but it was kind of cool. We got to mess around with the Arbor Tech wood shaping grinder. So it's okay. like a angle grinder that has carbide cutters on it. Freaking phenomenally cool. Like super fun. Not necessarily what I would call a fine woodworking tool. Definitely like a sculptural artistic tool though. Oh, sure. it's super fun. I'm like kind of waiting to take a couple trees out of my house so I can do some chainsaw carving and that bad boy is going to get used. So, um, but, uh, Colin is going to end up doing a shop made <clears throat> ladder ball. Is that what it's called? Okay. Yeah. Um, ladder ball set. And I am going to uh, do a lawn dart set. Um, so it would be like a turned lawn dart set. We're going to do steel points on them because I figure kind of everybody has own responsibility not to be idiots. Mm -hmm. so I think it's fine as long as they're not poison tip. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, yeah. and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not, I mean, I, lawn darts were, I think, outlawed in what, the 70s or 80s? Something I like that. I remember them in the 80s when I was, yeah, because we had a set where it was okay. a, it was like a stepped tip on there. Yeah. Uh, they were sharp though, right? Uh, not especially. Not like a, yeah. Okay. Sharp it's enough just that to go when, into the ground, but like, right. it's not like, I mean, gonna... when you mix lawn darts and teenage boys though, you know, where you're launching these things like, into orbit and then That's as they true. come down it's like an armor piercing shell yeah know? okay throw it as high as you can straight up in the air and then run <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. awesome or when you're so, doing it it's like instead of you know like being at one end and then throwing it and then going down there yeah. you and your brother are on opposite ends oh. and you're winging them ah gotcha so so we are going to do steel tips so i'm going to do like a rounded like i'm thinking like an eighth inch radius that should stick in dirt no problem yeah oh yeah I mean, heck, I could throw a screwdriver and stick it in the ground. But anyways, uh, so, so yeah, that'll be, that'll be kind of a fun project. Uh, but while we were working, uh, Colin was working on these mid-century nightstands, and he said, oh, I'm, I was going to put water-based poly on them. And they are uh, birch cases, walnut legs, and a birch drawer on them. Right. So, you know, contrasting woods, kind of that mid-century type look. I said, are you sure you want to do water based? It's like what oil is going to give you a Phil's nodding yes. See, and this <laughs> Kyle and I were talking about we're going to start a article in the magazine that is what grinds my chisels, and it's just going to be a debate article, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. two different views upon the same topic, uh, just for good banter, no name calling. Uh, but I said yeah, I think you should try an oil poly because I think it's going to give it a good look because he well. Let me back up. I believe initially he said, I want to give them a coat of linseed oil so to pop the grain and then water based on top. And I was like, why don't we skip that step and do an oil poly straight up? He's like, well, I've never used the oil poly really. I've always used water. And so I went and bought an oil poly because in the woodsmith shop, we do not have any oil poly, I guess. Um, used it all up. Used it all up, I guess. Uh, so I went and bought a thing of the just, I mean, it's like the not to bash on finishes, but there's some finishes that are better than others, in right. my opinion. Uh, generally, Minwax is carried everywhere. There's better finishes than Minwax for the most part, in my opinion. Uh, but the Minwax oil uh, it was the Minwax brush on oil poly, and he applied it with a foam brush. And he's like, holy cow, this like went on really smooth, went on really nicely, great color. And I was like, I might have converted him. So I guess what's what's everybody's shtick against oil finishes? Because forever they were the only thing. Right. And now I see most people leaning towards water-based. Um, not yeah. saying you guys are wrong, but tell me why... You're what wrong. I mean, you people. Yeah. No, I like oil finish. I like the look of it better. 
but I would say mm-hmm. the downside is the slow drying time, uh, harder cleanup, a little bit more because you have to use solvents and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. The smell maybe be a downside, yeah, I, but I, I enjoy the smell. Yeah, <laughs> put me in a closed room with some oil finish <laughs> <laughs> next to a well, furnace. So I mean that. Okay, I will say that is a completely valid point. The finish or the cleanup of oil finishes, anything not water based is a pain in the butt. I mean, yeah, and to, I mean it can get pretty expensive. I mean, you're dumping, you're basically using a, I don't know what mineral spirits is a gallon it has to be, fifteen or twenty bucks a gallon, I would think. Is that what it is? I don't know. I I don't know. I I have so many gallons of it at home. I don't I don't know. But <laughs> to the Googles. Yeah, but you're using it to wash up a brush and then you have to deal with the mineral spirits like how do you get rid of the mineral mineral spirits like i get it it's it's a pain that's why i buy brushes and throw them away (laughs) when menards has their free brush set after rebate buy a bunch of them yep there you go so phil what's your what's your because you're a water-based guy you like water-based i really like using water-based finishes and Part of it is what John alluded to already is, uh, you know, my shop is unheated. Mm -hmm. So if I'm working on projects in the winter, I really can't use oil-based finishes in the house to apply a finish because it's going to stink up the whole house. Uh, I think a lot of people have switched to water-based finishes because of uh, local emissions restrictions, okay. you know, like you essentially cannot use and somebody from California can totally prove me wrong here, but <laughs> in California, you pretty much can't use oil-based finishes commercially. Sure. So if you're a commercial woodworker, you need to use something that does not contribute to, uh, air pollution, local air pollution. Yeah. So that, you know, like lacquer is allowed because, uh, Lacquer thinner acetone is not considered a uh, an ozone inducing chemical. Uh, Water based finishes are fine because of that. Same way, yeah. so. But that, you know, for a home woodworker, I mean, obviously you want to follow local regulations. I'm gonna just put that out there. But you know, most home woodworkers are not using finishes in large quantities. So I I switch to water based finishes because of the odor primarily second is that it dries super fast. I can put a coat on an hour or an hour and a half, depending on what in what humidity levels are. Sure. Uh, the other thing is, is that, but I, I, I'll caveat that though with, um, I like light colored woods to look light colored. Okay. So you so, don't, you don't like the honey. I don't like the honey look of maple okay. or birch. I want, I prefer those to look that pale white color. I like to preserve that. I know that over time they're going to, uh, they're going to accumulate their own patina and, uh, and tone down. But I often think that a lot of oil based finishes will make them too yellow to start with. Um, so that's that. And that's, that's kind of a preference on my part. It's totally a personal preference. However, you know, like for materials like, uh, cherry and walnut, which I use quite a bit, I will put a wash coat of tongue oil, no, not tongue oil, usually boiled linseed oil, or like a tinted shellac to bring out some of the, cause amber colors on those materials will enhance the, uh, you'll see John smiling in the YouTube version of this one because one of his first girlfriends was Amber shellac. Yeah. yeah. Back in, back in high school. Went to, yeah. Went to, so he's got uh, some, yeah. he's got some feelings there. Yeah. I was just Amber. waiting for you to say Amber Shellac when you said the <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Amber tones will enhance the colors of 
materials like walnut and cherry mahogany sure. the, the medium and darker toned woods to bring out those darker colors when you use a straight water-based finish on walnut and cherry it can look a little washed out or faded or something like that so i although i will say you know like uh some of the newer water-based finishes from like general finishes and old masters their water-based finish does include just a small amount of a toner in there so that you can apply them to those materials and they don't look as gray as they used to yeah see so that's that that's where i go with it um yeah i actually like and i find the same thing too on on the oaks and again it's totally personal preference but too much oil based finish on oak often ends up giving it that golden oak mm -hmm. kind of like throw up in the back of your mouth look to it and when you know we've done some projects here for the magazine and we spray lacquer which is a totally different animal um but it doesn't impart the same kind of color to it that yeah. i like the look of a water-based finish on white oak or a lacquer on white oak because it allows that natural color of white oak to stand on its own. Yeah. See this, this coat tree behind me that has just straight, I think it was tongue oil Yeah. on it. And I, I get, I get the golden oak thing on it. Um, it's a different color than like my desk is, which is definitely true golden oak. Right. It's, it's darker. It's richer. Um, it's, it's different. I feel like oil on oak gives it a different, how do I want to, it's a different depth than if you stain it. Sure. It, it definitely, it brings the wood more to the forefront than just a canvas for a color, basically. Um, so there's definitely, I mean, it doesn't show up on my webcam here, but like there's definitely variation in this and you wouldn't get that if you stained it. Um, so, and that... I guess I get the, I get the cleanup. So let me ask you this with water-based finishes. And I'd be interested to hear from anybody on this. Do you, as you're cleaning up, just wash it up in the sink. Mm -hmm. So it just goes right down the drain. Yeah. Okay. I mean, cause I'm using there's, well, here's what I do is in between coats. I usually just dunk the brush in a cup that has water in it. Sure. Um, so when I'm done with a job is when I'll wash out the brush and I'm yeah. using a good amount of water so that it's diluting yeah. the finish. And then I'm also using detergent to yeah, wash out, break it down, which will break it down. And sure. So I, I look at it that way, you know, so it's not like I'm going to clog the drain with, you know, clumped up yeah. finish or something in there. So, and <sighs> I, what was it? What did I do? I did something recently that was shellac. Oh, you know, what it, was? <laughs> it was my, uh, dining room table. I did. It was, I started it with a boiled linseed finish, mm -hmm. um, a hot boiled linseed finish. And which is funny. That's the one time I bought a nice oil brush, which for linseed oil, you don't need a nice oil brush, but I bought a nice oil brush and I, I cleaned it up, you know, cause I maybe mean, I spent 15 or 20 bucks on the brush and Whenever I do clean something up like that with mineral spirits or whatever, um, I keep a burn barrel out by my lumber yeah. that I usually keep about three quarters full with um, shavings. So if I if I turn something here at the shop, I'll pack it in shavings in a box, bring it home, seal it at home, put the turning on the shelf, but then all those shavings I'll dump in the burn barrel um, right. if, if I don't need a mulch a tree or something. So usually what I do is I'll go out and I will dump the mineral spirits, let's say in the burn barrel with the shavings. So they absorb it. Um, yeah. EPA might have an issue with that, but I do it so infrequently. I don't think it's that big a deal. Some of the spray paints outside, I think probably is putting out more, you know, nasty stuff than I am. Um, I personally, and this is completely just from how I work. I appreciate how slow oil finishes are to dry because I feel like it gives me a chance to get them leveled out and I don't feel like I have to rush. Hmm. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I I understand that water water based finishes they don't dry that quickly. I mean, right. thirty five forty minutes usually they're starting to dry. So I think on most projects you have time to kind of go through and level them out and stuff. Um, but I like with a like a wipe on poly or a brush on poly or something that I can really I can do the coat. Then I can step back with a light, kind of look at it, see if there's any runs. If there are runs, I can hit them again, you know, smooth them out. Um, have you ever tried to repair any water-based finish, Phil? Yeah, I have because I've had places where, especially early on, you know, like, and I've said this before. So it's like everything that you do in woodworking requires practice. Sure. And the same thing with applying finishes and there were some times early on when I would get drips where you just weren't paying attention or didn't, yeah. you know, you apply finish and then instead of just walking away, like, you know, do a once around again, just to yep. see where things are. And then when I go back, you know, and you find a, a, a run and you have to scrape it off, yep. you know, it, it's at that point, you got to think like what you should do is wait for it to fully harden. And then you can scrape it off with a chisel or a scraper. Yep. What I often do is panic, freak out and try and <clears> scrape <throat> it off. And it's only partially cured. So then it Skimmed. leaves this kind of mm -hmm. like bubbly, wrinkly schmear at the end. And then yeah. you have to kind of come back and fix that. So, yeah. So, but then I've also recoded stuff with water-based finish that you know, I had sand through on, or if it was just a piece that I needed to refinish and I've put. So I guess what I'm getting on. at is, and I don't, I'm not in any way going to pretend to be a expert on water-based finishes. The only one that I've ever really tried that I liked was the master's armor from, uh, from uh, old masters. Old masters. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, a, we did some videos with it and it's a really good one and it levels out really nicely. Oh yeah. yeah. And I could see using that on a lot of stuff. I'm getting, I was, I'm wondering if it, is it like a lacquer where it, it burns into itself or uh, is it, does it depend on the water-based finish? Probably depends know. on the water-based finish. I would say that it probably does not. Okay. That it's individual layers. Which would like make a, sense. Like a standard, it, like a standard varnish or oil-based yeah. finish. That, that would make sense because if you would put a wet glass on it, then it would dissolve the finish. Yeah. So that would make sense. So you need that some form of mechanical bond there, which would generally be a sand. Yeah, and I and I've heard that is a little overrated. Sure. Um, I mean, most of the time when you do the scuff sanding on a refinish or between coats, you're doing it to level the finish. Yep. And even out the sheen. And. Um, yeah, that's those are the primary reasons that you're doing it. But there's usually enough chemistry involved there, and you, to a certain extent, you're also cleaning the surface to oh, remove sure. impurities that can hinder a bond. Yeah, but you know, I, like most of the time when I'm putting on it, I'm I don't have it buffed out, super shiny that I'm creating a ultra slick surface that nothing is going to stick to it. I'm just creating more of a matte or a satin finish. Yeah. Which is definitely what I prefer is that satiny. I don't, there's very few times where I want a high gloss finish. I think usually only if, if I've colored the wood, so like a turning that I've colored with dyes or something, and I want that high gloss to really pop the color. Yeah. Um, or if it's a design element, I guess, like this humidor I'm going to be working on, I, I'm going to go, I think I'm going to French polish the, the spalted maple top on it. Sure. Um, just for that super high gloss, glassy look, um, just, just from a design standpoint to contrast with the matte, uh, wood, but generally I like that satin finish. I was going to say the, the, the dining table I did, like I said, was boiled linseed oil initially. And then I decided that that just, as much as I like it in my head, like, oh yeah, no, no problem. We're going to just put a coat of oil on it every couple months and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be beautiful. I'm not going to do that. I know myself, I'm not going to do that. So instead I put a, I left the oil, boil, boiled linseed oil on the base, but the top I did a wipe on poly, the Minwax wipe sure. on poly, which is just their standard poly thin down. Yeah. Um, and that is a, 
if I remember right, don't quote me on this, but if I remember right, it's like a, you know, dries to the touch in two hours, recoat between like four and six hours. Okay. If it's after six hours, it requires 24 hours plus a sanding to recoat. Yeah. So it's one of those things. Once the chemical bonds really start to take effect, that's when you need to sand it for that mechanical adhesion. Right. Um, it's it's going to be one of those things. I'm going to have to refinish it here uh, whenever I get to it. it. Nothing to do with the finish itself. The finish itself is holding up perfectly fine. Um, it's more that uh, I was rushing to get it done for Christmas, and I sanded the top so I have some raised glue joints on it. Oh, sure. So you can feel where some of the glue joints are. You just feel a little ridge of glue. So I'm going to just come back, hit it with some, you know, 240, level everything out, and then give it one more coat. So... But yeah, no, it was just an, it was an interesting thing because Colin was very, I've only done water base, but you know what? Now that I, and he said, he's like, you know, this might make me rethink oil. And I know it's not for everybody. Yeah. And I mean, I've used plenty of oil based finishes yeah. you know, because of stuff that we've done here or whatever. And, you know, there was a guy, one of the designers here before Kent Welsh, uh, took finishing very seriously and he uh, a lot of times what we did in the past was use uh, armor seal or seal a cell by general finishes. They're, they're very similar finishes as a wipe on. And we usually just did like two coats. It looked good. It wasn't, you know, depending on what you did with it, it wasn't super smooth or whatever, but it had good color yep. and a good, good surface protection. But Kent would go at it with, you know, four or five coats, rubbing it out in between. And his projects looked amazing that he finished because he had like this really smooth surface. They weren't all super shiny, but they were just very well yeah. done. So, you know, one of one of the projects that I see around the office here that I've always loved the finish on is that there's that low boy downstairs. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was that one that he did. No, that one, I believe Steve Johnson did that one. Did he? Because I, the, I mean, just the fit, just every time I'm walking into the main floor, don't touch oh, it because yeah. I touch it all the time. Right. Don't get my germs. Yeah. It just, it feels great. And it just has yeah. a nice finish on it. And maybe Kent did do the finish on it. I'd have to ask Steve, see what he remembers. Yeah, I'll ask him. But yeah, no, it's just one of those things. And that's, as much as I appreciate being able to spray lacquer here, you know, kind of looking, looking forward to the spring when we start building my shop. And I, I talked to you about it, Phil. It's like, do I, do you put a spray room in there? Like, is it worth it? I just, I like wiping on finish too much. Yeah. It's easy. You know, the, the tongue oil or Danish oil works nicely. It's like, it's a look I like. So yeah. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it that way. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that's the reason that I like the water base finishes the way that, you know, a nice quality water base finish, you know, totally understanding that Old Master sponsors our TV show. I get that. Yeah. Master's Armor is amazing. It, yeah. it, it, it is. Well, and they have um, the Master's Armor, you can use it straight out of the can, if I remember right. Yeah. But they also have a hardener you can mix in with it. Yes. So for like, and they, if I remember right, what they told us when they were here, it's been a couple of years since they were here showing it to us. Uh, if I remember right, it was a wear additive. It was like you mix it in to increase the wear resistance for like flooring. If I, right. rem if I remember correctly, but it was like, if you, if you mix it, you have to use it within 30 days or else it kind of dissipates. Dissipates or hardens though in the can. I, I don't remember if it hardened in the can or if he just said it wasn't as effective. I don't I don't recall. Sandy, if you're listening, you can correct us on that one. So. <laughs> yeah. So I I have used water based finishes on when we sold our last house. My dogs had destroyed our hardwood floor. So I sanded it down and I used water based on that. And it worked really nicely. Yeah. Um it made the house stink though. Like hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't like a, like a VOC. It wasn't like a, a solvent smell, but God, I made the house stink for about a week. Some, 
some of them I've used in the past have kind of like an ammonia smell. That's that's probably what it was, and it was a it was varathane. Um, yeah, it was like the varathane water, high traffic wood floor finish. It went on great, and it, I applied it with like a lamb's wool applicator. Did the whole spiel. It looked awesome, um, but it stunk. Yeah. So I mean, like anything. I mean, you've probably seen it too. Is you know the right applicator and the right tools to go along some, with something. You know, like you know, I've seen people talk about using foam brushes for water-based finishes or, you know, they think yeah. water-based finish. This is like the latex paint I put on my house. I'm going to use the same brush that I use for my house paint. You can, it'll work. It's going to be harder. Yep. Um, but I found, you know, uh, tools for working wood makes brushes specifically for water-based finishes yeah, I know and they're pricey saying. and they're, they're super awesome. Yeah, well, but before that I used paint pads those okay. little white replaceable, yeah. mm -hmm. whatever they come in different sizes. Like there's a little wee little one that you can use for yep. molding and stuff like that. Those work remarkably well, way better than any, any brush commonly available brush. Interesting. Well, you know what I picked up from you, Phil was using the Dacron brushes for shellac. Oh yeah. Yeah. That works great. Yeah. Um, if you're not padding it on those Dacron brushes work awesome. So let's go to Michael's or to Hobby Lobby and buy a pack of, you know, eight of them for like, they're like 20 bucks. They're not super cheap, but yeah, they work well, especially since whenever I shellac something, usually it's not, I'm not using, I'm not doing like an armoire in shellac. Right. Usually it's a small, you know, box. The biggest thing I've done in shellac is uh, the curly maple toolbox from the last issue of pop wood. Sure. You know, that's about the maximum size I'm going to shellac something. Yeah. So. John, what do you got? I don't know. Oh, that sounds great, guys. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> uh, John, I have to ask, since yeah. I didn't listen to the podcast last week. Okay. Are you planning on bringing the playset with you? No. I would prefer to leave the indoor playset and the loft and the outdoor playset and not have to touch them or move them. Okay. Okay. So that's my hope. That's my hope. All right. We'll see. I hope uh, a family with some little kids that would enjoy that stuff buys our house and I don't have to move those things. I'll tell you what, if you have to move it, let me know and we'll bring my tractor over and we'll just pick it up and put it in a trailer. <laughs> there you go. It'll be awesome. Uh, yeah. Since you weren't on last week, Logan, we got this yeah. comment from last week's show from Rick B. <laughs> I know which one it is too. Great discussion as always, and twenty minutes shorter without Logan. Does that yeah. mean something? <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Not related at all. Nope. It was funny. We got a lot of comments on the on the what constitutes a woodworker yeah. discussion. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. I knew we would. I mean, there's a lot of opinions yeah. out there. So I thought it was funny. I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, yeah. you know, not going to open up that can of worms again though. Yeah. <laughs> not right away <laughs> though. Not for it's, a while. Right. We'll wait for a little bit and then we can kind of simmer, poke the bear again. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys working on any projects? We haven't done a project update in a while. Have we? Hmm. I'm working uh, on all the home projects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All the things that I should have been doing in the last 10 years, fitting them into a few months. So That's just fair. re re uh, or I, uh, uh, power washed our little deck and re finished that. It's looking nice. So do you use a transparent stain or did you stain it? Or I, you... it's like a cedar color and i started putting it on and it's like ew i hate this but then i got all done it's like oh it looks pretty good because normally like on fresh cedar i would do like a natural like right. clear and like that would look great but it's like after i power washed it, it was kind of there were some spots that were uneven so i was like uh oh, maybe i should stain this and go dark because it was pretty you know pale and gray and still yeah. mm -hmm. you know patina so i was like we'll even it out with some 
of cedar stained and it's like oh it looks pretty nice so there you go yeah, yeah. cool so I can get all this stuff done and then have to go to the next house and do that stuff right away there. So, <laughs> But you'll fair. be like practiced up for right. it. Right. I'll be all so. warmed up. Muscles are loose. Yeah. Let's mm-hmm. go. It's so. funny because I, and I ask because I just, I got a play set from one of our, our, I don't know, it's not technically our group president anymore. I got a play set from one of our coworkers mm-hmm. and same thing. It was a cedar play set. I just put it up like two weeks ago and I mean, it's, been out at his house for 10 years so it needed a pressure washing i pressure washed it cut the feet off of you know shortened by three inches to get rid of any rot that was on it and i'm like i need to stain this thing but the wood doesn't look that great so i went with one of like the where the the solid stains which is basically a paint i mean it's let's call it what it is it's basically thin paint paint. yeah yeah and i i bought a sprayer to apply it because i'm like i can either do this by brush or roller or whatever. There's so many nooks and crannies. I'm like, that's going to take forever. My time's worth more. So I bought a, a decent like airless sprayer and sprayed it. And same thing. I'm like, God, this looks stupid. And then I got it done. And I'm like, Oh, it looks great. You know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I borrowed my brother-in-law's uh, pressure washer and was doing the deck. It's like, oh, this looks pretty nice. And then yeah. moved on to the vinyl siding. It's like, oh, it's really getting it clean. And then it's like the air conditioner, like the top of that. And I was just doing everything. It's like, oh, this is kind yeah. of addictive. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I'm going to have to get my own. Now you're going to have to do, then you'll start doing the driveway and sidewalks. Yeah. And... Yep. Yep. It's like, hey, guys, can we carve pumpkins with this thing? So, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to experiment a little. That's so. funny. Phil, are you working on projects? Uh, I think I shared not that long ago. I finished two Christmas projects. Um, tomorrow I'll wrap up my two sleds that we made for the kids. Mm-hmm. So then we'll just have to start waiting for snow, which yep. I mean, this is, people will get this and it's going to be like the first day of October. So, right. So any day now. So yep. yeah, anytime, who knows? Um, so I'm hoping we get a lot of snow. I have a couple of other Christmas presents that I'm working on. One that's almost done except for the painting and finish, which is kind of fun. And then I have another one that's kind of been in process for a while that I just need to get back to it. So it's a, a pizza peel that we've mm. done. But I'm going to change the shape of it because I found a, a shape online. Um uh, there's a lady online who wrote a book about breadboards okay. and, and we're not, not talking about like cutting boards, but like old school breadboards. They're usually round to go with like traditional loaves. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a lot of times there's a, you know, the flat part where the bread goes, but then there's like a beveled rim that go that they have around them. Okay. And they'll either be carved or incised letters or something like that with some kind of saying or whatever. And she has some really cool ones. And then she also had some pretty interesting pizza peel or bread peel that she had discovered in her research that was part of it, you know, from, you know, different parts of Europe. Oftentimes people, when they baked bread, there was a communal bake oven rather than people had it in their house. So you'd have this gigantic oven and you'd just bring your dough and then it would get slid into the oven and then pulled out just because it was more efficient that way. Um, So I think it was a a historic vert style that just had a fun shape to it. So that's cool. Yeah. And then I'm trying to, I'd like to make some stuff and I always run into this, this time of year of like, what to make for my kids or my wife for a Christmas present. And it's, you know, our house has plenty of furniture in it. So it's like, then what, what can I make? And I've made everybody boxes. So they're kind of drowning in boxes. And even though I love making them, so it's like now, you know, where, where do I go from there? Yeah. Antarja. Maybe. Who knows? Uh, yeah. We just lost 
like 0.4 percent right. of our audience this is the third week in a row we've brought that up <laughs> we lost uh, them the first week so it doesn't matter they're not listening anymore uh, yeah so anyway we'll uh, see see once yeah. what happens interesting i i just ordered this week i ordered all the stuff for the humidor i'm gonna stop talking about it and just make it there you like, go the the problem is it's like i know what i want and i can't buy it so it's like this is silly i can't buy like a brushed stainless or a brushed nickel um, quadrant hinge i can buy them but they look cheap mm -hmm. oh like, yeah and it's like well so i gotta make a I gotta make a, a concession somewhere. It's like either I change everything to brass, which I don't really want. I really like the the black and silver look versus sure. black and brass, because I can get all the humidor internals in nickel or brass or nickel or silver um, and brass. So I might just do brass quadrant hinges, but then blacken them. Yeah, I think that would be okay. Should uh, check with Orion from I know I brasses. Check their site. They they have they have nickel or they're the nickel or stainless, like they're not quadrant hinges. They're like almost like butt hinges. Um, I, I, I looked. Yeah. But like call him because sometimes they can do, they'll do like a custom yeah. finish. I know I, I might, I might give him a call. So, but I've, it's been funny because the last couple of weeks I've, I've got to mess around with a lot of new tools, which are kind of fun. Yeah. Like, I love new tools. Um, and one of them that I got to mess around with a little bit that I'm going to use on this humidor is the Panto router. And it's pretty cool. Like it was designed. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of fun to see the, the history behind it. Cause it was, uh, Matthias Wendell, um, the YouTuber, he designed it out of wood yeah. and a company grabbed it and said, Hey, we want to make this out of aluminum and steel and sell it with your name on it. Or, you know, basically give you royalties for it. I'm assuming. Um, so we got one in and it's pretty slick. Like I'm, I'm going to use it for some loose mortises inside the miters or yeah, loose, loose tendons inside the miters. Yeah. Um, which I think will be kind of cool. So, uh, it's been fun to, to mess around with that. So it'll be interesting. Cool. Yeah. So I'm kind of waiting on, I, I'm, I kind of like lost my identity this last three or four weeks because I haven't ran my sawmill at all. I'm out of blades, to be honest with you. I'm out of blades. I'm waiting on my blades to be sharpened. Right. So kind of can't cut anything, but I got plenty to cut. Just can't cut any. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Shop Notes podcast. You can watch it on our YouTube channel and get it that way. Otherwise, you can find the Shop Notes podcast on all the podcast apps that are out there. It usually gets around to everything. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, we'd like to hear from you. You can email those to us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or leave them in the comments section below the YouTube video. You'll also find our show notes page at woodsmith.com slash podcasts. If you have any questions, that you'd like to have us address any topics in woodworking or tools to talk about. We'd love to hear from the, you as well on those. Otherwise we'll see you next week for another episode of the shop notes podcast. Bye everybody. This episode of the shop notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build from furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs, and more find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.